Okay, so in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to continue to take a look at environmental economics. We're going to really leave the modeling aside here. This is really just more of a fluff chapter to get at the theory, to get at why we really need action and why the sooner we act is really better for us and for society on whole. So in order to do that, there will be a little bit of modeling as we go through, but it'll be pretty light. What we're going to start off is really by taking a look at how big of a job it is and really really just why we really need everyone to get on board in order to, as a society, correct this and save this for the future. If you are really interested in this, there is actually a recent, I say recent, it's maybe three years old now, a CBC documentary that came out. It's known as 2050 Degrees of Change. Uh, what CBC did is they took a look at the life, kind of a typical life in BC's lower mainland around Vancouver and said, what would that life look like in the year 2050, given current climate change forecasts? In fact, taking a look at the forecast they chose was a fairly optimistic forecast for greenhouse gas emissions and where we'd end up. Given a lot of where we've at, um, progressed over the last four years since that kind of came out, it uh, makes it really unlikely that that would be where we end up. So keep that in mind as you're watching that. Maybe I'm a bit pessimistic. I really hope that we can have a better a better outcome than that. But let's jump over. Let's take a look at what we're going to be talking about today and some of our kind of models as to where what the future might hold for us. So first thing we need to differentiate between, and I think we've talked about this in a previous video, is the distinction between a stock and a flow variable. And the best way to kind of picture this, the difference between a stock and a flow variable is, let's think of a bathtub. So we have a bathtub, something like this, and let's say, there we go, there's the actual tub part. And we have our tap, and then we also have down here on the bottom, we have our drain. In the tub, we have some amount of water. So here we go, here's all of our water sitting there. This water that is in the tub, this is our stock, right? This is our stock of water, this is how much is there. What we then have is if we turn on the tap, we have water flowing in, this is our flow, this is what we add to the tub, right? And as we increase the flow, the stock increases faster and faster and faster. That is the flow is the rate of change of the stock. Similarly, if we pull the drain, we're also going to have water leaving. This would similarly be flow such that, hey, this would be positive flow. That would be negative flow. We would have a net flow between the two, which would then influence the stock variable, the amount of water there. So, that's the idea between a stock and a flow variable in terms of what we're talking about, which we're going to simplify just to be greenhouse gases. The flow is going to be how much we throw up into the atmosphere each year versus the negative flow, how much the earth is able to naturally reabsorb. The stock, the stock is how much is up there right now. How much greenhouse gases, how many parts per million of CO2 is floating around in our atmosphere. So on the one side, how much we add, how much gets reabsorbed, and how much is up there altogether. Well, let's take a look at what exactly that all works out to. So let's presume that we have our Earth, something like that, and that's our atmosphere. This is the Earth itself, and we have our land masses, something like this, and then we have all of our water in between, right? And on our land masses, we have our trees. In the water, we have our algae and all of our kelp and plant life as such. And then we have, of course, to all of our factories. We have natural sources emitting. We have volcanoes. We have cows, right? There's the cow farting. Right? We have all these natural emissions of CO2 up into the atmosphere. And then, of course, we have our sun. And the problem is, the problem is, is that, okay, traditionally, the sun comes in, hits the earth, and then 
bounces back out. Some of this gets then trapped again by the atmosphere and stays in. That is, some of the radiation gets out, some of this radiation stays inside and heats up the Earth. Right? This is our greenhouse effect. This is why on a hot summer day, inside your car is so much hotter than outside your car. Because the sun's energy gets through the windshield, but then loses energy in that bounce and can't get back out through the windshield. So it just keeps bouncing around and staying inside. As we, as we increase our emissions, we end up creating more stock of greenhouse gases up in the atmosphere. And what these stock of greenhouse gases do is they create more and more of the sun's energy staying inside. Less and less of it gets to bounce out. As less and less of it gets to bounce out, the greenhouse effect begins to happen more rapidly, and we have heating, right? And that is the basis of climate change. Keep in mind, right, everything that I've read, everything I've seen on this, everything I've been lectured to about this, is that this whole notion of global warming is a bit of a misnomer, a bit of a shooting ourselves in the foot, and that climate change really is the better term for this, because really what we're going to expect to see is a different climate, not necessarily a warmer climate. We're going to see greater variability, more frequent and more intense storms. We're going to have, yes, altogether an increase in global average temperature, but the variability of that temperature will be a lot greater. Cold places may be colder, hot places may even be hotter. So it's not just that the whole planet gets hotter, we get a greater variation in weather. And that's, that's a big cause of concern. Okay, in this, and this is, this is a few years old now, but in this we tend to, and this is going to be a flow variable, we have been throwing up approximately 50 billion tons of greenhouse gas a year. And this is, this is a few years old. This has actually been growing at about 1.6% per year. So that's probably about five years old now, that number, so it would be significantly higher today. So every year, the stock that's up there in the atmosphere, keep in mind, it's this stock of greenhouse gases that's causing all of this to bounce back. Stock, right? That's causing the problem. But luckily for us, we're not just throwing up 50 billion tons of greenhouse gases per year. Luckily for us, the Earth is also able to reabsorb it through the carbon cycle. Unfortunately, we figure that this amount of reabsorption is currently maxed out for a while. It was growing, but seems to be maxed out at about 5 billion tons of greenhouse gases annually. So we throw up 50 billion. The Earth seems to be maxed out at its ability to reabsorb at 5 billion, meaning every year we are adding to our stock of 45 billion tons of greenhouse gases. So every year, more and more and more greenhouse gases are building up, creating a denser and denser greenhouse effect, causing more and more of those sun's rays to get stuck in here, causing this climate change to occur. Okay, this is pretty drastic. The problem, the problem that's causing climate change is, of course, this stock. What needs to be done is we need to get this, in order to correct climate change, in order to just stop things from getting worse, we need to make it such that this net change in our stock becomes zero. That is, we would need to change this amount that we're throwing up to match what's getting sucked back down. That is what? We would have to drop our pollution by about 90%. Keeping in mind why we pollute, right? We don't just create pollution for the fun of creating pollution. Pollution is a byproduct of our consumption. That is, if we wanted to cut pollution just to hold things constant at where they are today, that's not making them better. That's just keeping things at where they are today. We would have to cut our production, our consumption by 90%. That's 90% less heat in your house, 90% less clothes you wear, 90% less that you drive, 90% less TV you watch, 90% less heat that you use, right? Across the board, consumption would have to fall by 90%. That's problematic, right? We see that just simply 
this whole idea of a carbon tax, that all of this to cut to this optimal level of pollution does not necessarily solve the problem. In fact, that would be drastic is by how much we would have to cut it by just in order to get us to be neutral, just to get us that we're not making the problem any worse. In the meantime, every time we just get this number to shrink, which we've yet to be able to do, this number has been growing year on year. Despite our efforts, we've still been throwing in more and more tons of greenhouse gases every year. If we get this to shrink, all we're doing is we're pushing off the inevitable. We're just making it longer and longer before that greenhouse effect becomes so great, before climate change becomes so unsustainable that life begins to collapse. That is ideal though. Ideal we want to be able to push this off because what we're talking about right now is given current technologies. Given our current technology, we cannot change our tons of greenhouse gas. The only solution today would be to cut consumption by 90%. And yes, here in the West, we're like, okay, sure, we have to do that. That's because we're spoiled with how rich we are. If we were to do this globally, we would have people starving. We would have people dying from thirst. We would have people freezing to death or from be dying from the heat, right? This is not a sustainable solution given our global population. So our best kind of goal today is to cut is to get this as low as we can get it, this is unrealistic. We're not going to get our consumption or production cut by 90%. We're not going to get our emissions cut by 90%. But what we need to do is we need to get this to stop growing. In fact, if we could even get this to start to shrink a little bit, so instead of 50 billion, maybe it's 48 billion, that way then we're pushing the problem off farther and farther into the future. By pushing this problem off farther and farther into the future, this gives us the ability to create new technologies. This gives us the ability to come up with other ingenious ways to solve this problem. That is not apparent to us today. So one of the big things. Ultimately, ultimately what we expect is that there is a 20 to 40 year leg between emissions and the climate, so what it actually does to us. So that is even essentially what we're throwing up today, all of that that's going up today won't be felt for another 20 to 40 years. And ideally, we want to push that off even farther, right? Well, if we wouldn't be pushing this off, that leg would still be there. But essentially, we've already locked in what 40 years from now will look like. The best we can hope for is to make 80 years from now look a lot better. That's, that's our hope in order for there to be better life for our offspring for future generations. So how exactly does this happen? Well, let's take a look at some of our costs of climate change. Let's take a look at some costs. So some of these costs is that we believe, and these are a bit outdated, but they're still fairly accurate. We believe that a two degree rise in temperature translates to about a cost of 1.44 trillion. This is just in dealing with increased insurance costs due to more volatile weather, um, protecting us from sea level rise, protecting us from increased heat, increased cold, the volatility of weather. Uh, if we had a four degrees rise, that would be a 3.2 trillion dollars. Okay. Further, we are likely uh, we are likely to witness a two foot rise in sea level. This is our current forecast that sea levels will rise by two feet by 2100, and that might not seem drastic, but for many of our most populated, most of our densely populated areas, that is that is where most of our people live. Most people live within that kind of area of, of the ocean. And that means that massive amounts of property is going to be underwater. It's going to be buried. Is going to be, we have to fight this, right? And that's going to be extra cost to us. This includes lots of low-lying island states, lots of low-lying developing areas that are going to be the hardest hit. What we're also witnessing is we're witnessing melting glaciers. And these melting glaciers, right? You say, okay, this is a contributor to our sea level rise, yeah, yeah, partly, 
But what it primarily is, the reason why this is a concern is it's a loss of fresh water and primarily a loss of fresh water in Asia and South America. Again, developing nations, nations that really need access to this fresh water. The melting ice caps, yep, that's going to add to these rising sea levels. Again, all together, two foot rise in sea levels, melting glaciers, melting ice caps. We expect this to displace tens of millions of people, right? This will be creating climate refugees. They're going to be looking for new places to live as their traditional homes, their agricultural lands, where they live, their cities have been reclaimed by the sea. Kind of lousy case estimates, but looking like pretty accurate estimates, we expect that by the year 2100, we're going to lose up to 50%. So loss of up to 50% of species. So massive loss of biodiversity on the earth. Just complete, complete extinction of about half of the species out there just not able to deal, not able to adapt quick enough to this climate change. Attached to this, changing in temperature is we're going to witness, changing in temperature and increased uh, volatility is we're going to witness reduced crop yields. So these reduced crop yields, this is primarily expected to hit hard in Africa and Asia, places that are already typically struggling with famine, especially in Africa, right? So Reduce crop yields hitting there. Solution to that really is our genetically modified plants. Being able to genetically modify strains of corn, wheat, etc. in order to be more resilient to climate change. Finally, as we've already mentioned, we're going to witness a rising intensity. A rising intensity and frequency of storms. And if you've watched kind of the uh, hurricane season hit U.S., hit, the, hit Mexico over the last few years, you've seen this, right? Ten years ago, these storms would hit and they'd be bad. But now we're getting hit with two, three hurricanes a year and they are devastating in comparison to what they used to be. So significantly more damage being done. Significantly more damage being done. And that, that there is the huge problem with that. Let's, uh, let's go back and let's talk about that whole rising sea level bit. And let's just see really how problematic that is. So let's start off. Let's start off by taking a look at Vancouver. And if we start off by taking a look at Vancouver, let's jump over to take a look at this here. There we go. What we have is this is Vancouver, greater Vancouver, the lower mainland. This is the expectation of where sea level would be if we just had a one foot rise. So what we can do is we can go take a look at this and say, okay, right here, this is by 2080 with unchecked pollution. That is, if we just continued on the path that we are at, that we would reach one, fit, one foot rise by 2080, right? And really that could be as soon as 2060, as late as 2120. Going in here, so here we would expect sea levels to rise at uh, New Westminster by one foot by 2100, could be as early as 2070, could be as later as late as 2200. So quite a bit of range there. Going up, well, we see this area here, not so much underwater, right? The blue being what is essentially underwater. What did we say? We said that, hey, two foot range is very likely based off of unchecked pollution, what we'd be looking at. And we see what's underwater. We see that a lot of Surrey here, a lot of Surrey is struggling. This is this is gone. Ladner, right? This whole area here, which is really fertile croplands, underwater, really challenging to keep the sea held back. A lot of problems there. A lot of Richmond gone, right? A lot of problems here. A lot of our lower mainland is right at or near sea sea level. You can play around with this, right? You can drop this up all the way to a 10 foot sea level rise and see what that looks like. Pretty lousy. You take a look, 10 feet of sea level rise, that's a little bit ridiculous. Take a look at that. This is forecasting a 10 foot level sea rise hitting right there in Stevenson by the year 2140. That's in only 120 years from now. That's not that far off. So pretty dire. This modeling is being done. 
You can take a look at this globally. I'll post this as well to our D2L. You can take a look for this map and say, okay, what is different areas looking all around the world? Once you get into the US, this is a US site. So they give you a lot more information in the US as to what's happening. And you can see where things end up underwater. They got a lot more granular detail down there than they do in Canada. You can take a look at statistics, products, and other bits of information. So, okay, so based off of all that, what are we doing going forward, right? What do we have to correct this? We've seen it, we've seen the sea level rise, we've seen the cost, we've seen, okay, this is an insane scenario for us to try to fix. What do we do going forward? Well, what we can do is we can introduce a bit of an identity. And this identity, that's, it's a little bit cheating, but what we can do is we can say, okay, greenhouse gases equals greenhouse gases. And you're like, yep, yep, that's true. Great, good, we agree. What we can then do is we can say that greenhouse gases equals greenhouse gases over energy times energy, right? All I've done is I've just times it by energy over energy. I've just times by one. I've changed nothing. I can then update this again and say, okay, greenhouse gases equals greenhouse gas over energy times energy over GDP. GDP, that's gross domestic product. That's a measurement in terms of dollars as to how much we are producing as a nation or global GDP would be how much we're producing altogether as a globe. And then I'm times it just by GDP times GDP. So there we go. We notice that, hey, this here just cancels itself back out just to be greenhouse gases equals greenhouse gases. Okay, so why, why would I do that? Well, the reason why I would do that is what I can do is I can say, okay, if I take a log difference transformation of this and don't get too caught up with what that means, is this is gonna roughly work out to a percent change in greenhouse gases is gonna be equal to a percent change in greenhouse gas per energy plus a percent change in the amount of energy we need per GDP plus the percent change, sorry, percent change in GDP. So what are each of these ones referring to? First case, first case, this is how intensive our energy production is in greenhouse gases. Do we need to release a lot of greenhouse gases to produce a kilowatt hour of electricity or not very many? Right, as we transition to solar, wind and all that, we'd expect this to drop. We'd expect to not be using as much greenhouse gases to make energy. So how intensive is our energy production in terms of pollution? Next term here, this term here is looking at how intensive our GDP is in terms of energy. So how much energy, how many kilowatt hours do we need to make a single dollar of output? Do we need lots of energy to make a dollar of output or just a little bit? And then finally, well, what's our percent change in GDP? Year over year, are we producing more and more and more or less and less and less? So let's take a look at this. Keep in mind what our goal is. If we were to take a look at this, we would want ideally just to be neutral, right? Just let's just go back and take a look at that. Just to be neutral, we would need the percent change in greenhouse gases to drop by 90%. That there would bring 5 billion up, 5 billion down. This would just make the stock be constant. So we want to get this to be decreased by 90%, or at least eventually get that, right? But okay. Over the last 17 years, this has actually been growing at about, what did I say, 1.6%. So that's what we've been at on average over the last 17 years. Well, what about the rest then? If we want to get this to shrink, what do we need to do? Well, first of all, let's take a look at this GDP growth. GDP growth, at the very least, we're having a growing population. A growing population means that more and more people need more and more stuff. They need at minimum more food, more clothing, more shelter, more education, more basic necessities. All of this means that these more people need more stuff to be produced in order to feed them. 
That is, even in the best case scenario, this is going to continue to grow, just simply due to population growth. On average, this has been growing at about 3% per year. If we were able to keep GDP per capita constant, so that is, hey, the amount of stuff we consume today would remain constant into the future forever, it would still be growing at a rate of 1% per year. So problematic. The only way to really get this down is if we decreased our consumption today. And you, you can see why that's not necessarily politically favorable. People don't like that. But things like our carbon tax or our cap and trade, that's what they target. They're targeting a decrease in production, a decrease in consumption to lower our GDP today. Because as GDP lowers, so does this. But we see that that, that hurts us. That hurts our consumption. That hurts our utility. So we don't like it. Well, what's the next one? The next one is how much energy we need to produce a unit of output. Well, here's the good news. This has been decreasing. It has been decreasing, but many have argued that all the gains have been found and it's now stabilized. Um, this here, best case scenario, is that this might, this is probably sitting at maybe something like negative 0.05, right? Pretty near zero, slightly negative, is that every year we're making slight gains and that we're becoming more and more energy efficient in how much GDP we're using. So, okay, good, good, but what, what are we sitting at right now? We'd still be sitting at plus 2.95% per year. Ah, that's problematic, right? Not what we want, not what we want. So, okay. Keep in mind, I don't know the exact number for that. It's hard to estimate. It's just expected that it's slightly negative. It might be a bit bigger than that. I'm just picking a number there for a demonstration sense. That leaves this guy. That leaves this guy. How greenhouse gas intensive is our energy production? Well, this here is becoming negative as we transition to cleaner and cleaner fuel. As we transition to solar, nuclear, wind, tidal, all of these, as we transition, it is becoming more and more beneficial to us. This here is becoming increasingly negative, decreasing this altogether. The problem is, is that so far, this has been not fast enough. We have not been witnessing enough, quick enough transformation in this, in our energy production. We haven't witnessed a quick enough transition into green energy. What helps this? What pushes us into this transition to green energy? Well, again, as we talked about, these policies encourage private companies to invest into research and development into these so that they stop paying a tax, stop having to pay to pollute. They don't want to pay to pollute. They'd rather just come up with a new clean technology that's free for them to use and then be able to just not pay the tax. So again, these encourage greener technologies, but not fast enough. So let's take a look at what some of these greener technologies are. And to be honest, this is really where things are quite optimistic, quite looking up. When I first started teaching and going through this about four or five years ago, this was quite pessimistic. It was saying, hey, yes, we have these green technologies, but ah, the engineering, the technology is not there for them ever at least not any time in our lifetime to be efficient enough to be worthwhile. This is changing. This is now saying, hey, you know what? Within the next five, 10 years, we might be able to do this. In fact, in 2020 already, we've now completely changed this rhetoric, uh, this rhetoric. And we've said, hey, it is now cheaper to produce energy by wind, by solar than it is by coal. So this is changing so rapidly fast, faster than we could have ever hoped for but oh, it's still, still we wonder, is it actually fast enough? So what are these green sources of energy? Well, the first one, first one that we have is, of course, our wind or our solar. And wind or solar is great. Like I said, I've already been kind of tooting the horn of this guy. We've been making massive advancements in this and great. It seems to be, it seems to be from the readings I've done, our problems with wind and solar still fall back onto battery technology. 
And that is with coal, with hydro, with many of our other traditional, so, um, even nuclear power, our traditional forms of energy production, they can be ramped up or ramped down based off of demand. You can't do that with wind and solar. Wind and solar, they're going to create the electricity based off of the weather, based off of what's happening, and we need to store it. We need to store it so that we have to have it available for when demand is high and then store it away, build it back up when demand is low. Battery technology, that is our shortfall in this from everything that I've come across. So while this is getting cheaper to produce, it seems this is still our shortfall. So big areas of research, big areas of advancement to be had in that. And of course, there's big incentive in this too. So it's not that there's nothing being pushed in this direction. Our second problem with wind and solar though, second problem with them is the opportunity cost. The problem is wind and solar farms typically use a lot of land. This land, land itself carries a large opportunity cost with it. And so by using land that could be used for others, other things, well, we've now lost that. So wind and solar carry an opportunity cost. What else do we have? Well, of course we have hydropower. Hydropower, this is a big thing in British Columbia here. Uh, hydropower really is great, it's clean, but it kind of seems that we've kind of hit our capacity with hydropower. Uh, we've kind of dammed a lot of our feasible dam sites. The ones that are left remaining, well, we can get a bit of extra power out of them, but not a ton. So hydro seems to be kind of at its limit. Uh, farther the problem with hydro is that in the process of building the dam, you flood massive amounts of area behind it for the reservoir, which again carries with that the opportunity cost of land. So problem with hydro seems to be this whole, we've kind of hit our capacity. Um, additionally, as fresh water becomes more and more scarce, there always becomes the geopolitical risks um, of what happens when you start to dam rivers, which flow downstream across borders. That is, you prevent fresh water from accessing your neighboring countries. Becomes a bit problematic in that side. Uh, what else do we have? We have nuclear. So nuclear power, this is a clean power source. This is actually significantly cleaner than burning coal. Uh, more people die every year from the environmental impacts caused by coal than have ever died from nuclear accidents. That being said, right, we have a big fear of nuclear. We have a big uncertainty, a big unknown with it. And it's kind of this realm of myth, this realm of comic books, this realm of just urban legend. And so we have a lot of our speculations, a lot of our uncertainties, a lot of our fears with this. And as a result, we've actually seen nuclear power, at least the share of energy generation from nuclear power, be decreasing year over year. So while nuclear is clean, although it's really efficient, it's very cheap to produce on a per unit basis, we've been moving away from it out of fear. So nuclear is not really a good mix in order to fit on, in on this, mostly due to public perception. We would also then have the opposite of nuclear, and that would be fusion. So this would be more like how our sun works. Uh, fusion research, we've been at this since the 50s. Um, since for quite a while now, the big joke in fusion has been we're 10 years away from a workable model. Unfortunately, we've been saying that since about the 60s. So we've always been kind of at this. We're right on the edge of a breakthrough. We just need more money into this. Fusion arguably would cure all of our energy problems. Um, I kind of wonder if really fusion would end up falling into the same category as nuclear, even if we could figure it out. That is, given the uncertainties, given the fear around it, it might never actually come to fruition just out of public perception. So fusion's problematic with that too. So out of our green energy sources then, we've seen that, well, okay, hydro's kind of at an end. Public perception has not allowed nuclear to take hold and fusion, well, fusion is just not viable and there's fear that public perception might not allow it to either. This leaves, this leaves wind and solar, right? This leaves wind and solar as a possibility. We have our hangups with it, battery technology is being one of the big ones, but it looks to be the promising one going forward. The question is, can we make these technological changes fast enough in order to drop this greenhouse gas intensity of energy production. If we could drastically drop this guy, it would drastically drop our greenhouse gas emissions, or at least our percent of greenhouse gas emissions year over year. That's the hope. But there's always the thing as to, well, what happens if we can't, if we can't do this fast enough? 
What if we cannot transition to a green economy fast enough? Well, there's also this concept of geoengineering. And depending on who you talk to, this concept of geoengineering is a huge possibility and potentially our only kind of short-term savior, or it is the thing of nightmares. And this geoengineering is essentially saying, what if we begin to engineer our planet to be able to deal with a high carbon future? This could be things such as we could start to put in carbon capture. So we can start to just drag carbon out of the atmosphere, decreasing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere altogether, putting it back into the ground and engineering things in that way. Could be quite expensive. We have models that seem to be working for this, but the issue becomes scalability. We could also be looking at kind of an increase or a difference in the way in which we cloud seed. So cloud seeding, this has been happening for quite a few years already. Uh, China had been using it going back to the Beijing Olympics, if not farther. And this is essentially shooting particles up into the upper atmosphere to create clouds. As we create more clouds, clouds are white. They reflect a lot of the sun's energy back into space, preventing the heating of the earth. So this could happen, right? And we could be doing this and we could create a cooling effect for the earth on whole, mitigating or offsetting climate change. But Many people are really skeptical about this. It seems like this is a huge experiment that we're running without really knowing what the results are going to be. So just a rogue experiment that could completely change life on Earth as we know it. So a lot of skepticism about whether or not we should actually engage in geoengineering. The flip side of that is, well, we've already been engaging in geoengineering for the last 100 years or so in everything we've been doing with climate change. So, hey, if we've already been engaging in this uncontrolled experiment, why not engage in another to try to correct it? Is that a valid argument? Ah, may, may not be. Uh, geoengineering, this is actually a huge field, a huge area of debate for it. I've included in the comments here a bunch of links that you can follow for more discussion on this geoengineering. Additionally, I've also included in the links some, sorry, in the comments, a link to alternative energy sources, the International Energy Association, annually releases their clean energy report and shows kind of the movement of energy sources and the viability of these green sustainable energy sources into the future. So that's linked in the comments as well for farther reading. But okay, we've said all this, what's really the crux of it? What are we really getting at? So getting back, keep in mind, we need to decrease our greenhouse gas emissions per year. Right. Overall, we need to get these guys to be 90% lower than they currently are today to just stopping the problem from getting worse. That's not making the problem better. That's just stopping things from getting worse. That is making it so that we're not adding to the stock anymore. In order to do that, what are our options? Well, we have a change in GDP. This here, I would say this is our short term option. That is, we can influence this GDP. This is the amount of consumption and production that we're doing today. We can influence this with things like carbon taxes and cap and trade. This is not a long-term solution because just simply by population growth, we're going to need more GDP to continue to feed, house, shelter, clothe new people. So yes, in the short term, this can buy us more time. It's not a long-term solution. Long-term solution, our long-term solution seems to be to decrease the greenhouse gas intensity of energy. Again, this can be incentivized. This can be pushed to have new research and development into these green technologies. Again, this can be pushed through that cap and trade, right? Through that carbon tax. The fear is this is not happening fast enough, that we're not going to be able to transition to a green economy rapidly enough. We've got too much political impediments, technology, technological impediments, legal impediments, right? We have all of these kind of resistances towards transitioning to this. And because we're dragging our heels, it's not going to go fast enough. And maybe then, if that is the case, maybe our result might actually be geoengineering. Maybe that will be kind of our only hope, hope in the near term. Okay, that being said, we've taken a look at this kind of overview of environmental economics. We've taken a look at kind of the current state, kind of our hopes as we move forward. What we're also going to be looking at to summarize all this is just what are the big takeaways? So big takeaways from this video really are how the stock of greenhouse gases, that's our big issue. 
We have this 20 to 40 year lag time on what's going to happen. We have massive costs in order to correct this. Mind you, we're also going to have massive costs in dealing with climate change if we don't correct it. Finally, this model that we looked at right here, this whole how do we change our greenhouse gases, this identity of splitting it up into three parts. What we need to take away from this is that changing GDP, this is our short term solution through our cap and trade, through our carbon tax, through making it essentially more expensive for us to uh, produce and consume. Long term, technological hope is our only real hope in that. If you have any questions on this video, feel free to reach out to me either through D12 Frequently Asked Questions or by email. Thanks.